My talk is entitled Inverse Problem in Quantum Materials, Analytic Continuation of Response Functions with Neural Networks. This is one of the scariest talk I've ever, sc scariest title I've ever, I've ever used for one of my talks. So I will try to take you smoothly into this, uh, what all of this mean, means. And unfortunately, I cannot say that we will scratch the surface because what we will have to do is to dive very deeply in, into the, the subjects and just like grab some aspects of the, the, the research project down the way because it is a very technical project. It all starts at the same place where Umar uh, started the, his introduction with materials. So this is the elements of the periodic tables, table that you have in your pocket if you have a phone in your pocket right now. So never in the history of mankind have we have so many elements in our pockets. Uh, as you can see in the batteries of a smartphone, there are a few elements. Uh, of course, in the processing unit of the smartphone, there are many materials that are involved uh, to dope the semiconductors. But also, if you think about the microphone, the speaker, you have to have very powerful magnets that will be able to produce movement into your smartphone. And all of these technologies are, 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 reside on our understanding of those materials. So understanding the materials is crucial if we want to build the technology as Umar described. And one of those things is uh, the screen of your smartphone. If you think about it, the screen of your smartphone is transparent so you can see through it, but at the same time, it has to be conducting so that when you put your finger, it can detect where your finger is. And this is a very peculiar property. Not many materials have this, and there are a lot of uh, industrial secrecy about this. And we will see that conductivity is a property that I'm interested in for the, the rest of the talk. So remember conductivity. Then when you think about the future technology, uh, there are some materials right now which we know exist, but we cannot explain the properties that they have. For example, Umar mentioned the superconducting materials. Superconductors are a class of materials which when they are cool, uh, very, very cool, very cold, very, very low temperature, they can levitate above magnetic materials or they can conduct electricity without any uh, loss of energy. So this is a very important material for the future of technology if we could understand how it works very well. Graphene is another example. You may have heard about the extraordinary properties, both mechanical properties and electrical properties of graphene for the future of electronics, for example, or even uh, uh, bulletproof vest and things like this. And one of the lesser known materials that has come up in the last few years are topological materials or topological insulators, which are conducting only on the surface of the materials, but not in the bulk, or in some very exceptional cases, only on the edge of the materials and not on the faces. So these are very promising materials for inventing all kinds of technologies. But in order to be able to very push the limits of those materials, we need to understand how they work. And the big problem with that is that uh, for many of those materials, the correlations between the movement of electrons in one part of the material and the correlations with the movement of electrons in the other part of the materials are very challenging mathematical problems. Um, if I think, for example, of some of the superconductors I was talking about just before, if you shine a laser to the, through the material, you will eject some electrons. And if you map all the positions of if you map all the directions of those ejected electrons, you can kind of create a map of how the electrons were moving in the superconductor. And when you do that, you are expecting, with the classical theories for materials, you're always expecting to find some pockets that looks like this. But in very wild cases, you will find blurry uh, patches of electrons disposition. And this is not understand at the moment. These are results that are unexplained by the current theories. So as Umar explained in, the, in, in his talk, you could try to predict the properties of materials with neural networks by training the neural networks on, on simulations of those materials. But in the case of superconductors in particular, it's impossible to do so because our current theories cannot even predict the properties in the materials in the first place. Now, one of the properties I'm interested in, as I said, is the conductivity and not any conductivity. As you can see, this is a conductivity as a function of omega which is the frequency. So you're familiar with frequency if you know that your, your power outlet outputs 60 Hertz frequencies 
of electricity. This is a given frequency. And now the conductivity can be a function of that frequency. So some materials uh, are better conductors at high frequency and, and worse conductor at low frequency and so on. So this function, like knowing exactly the shape of this function is a very hard problem if you want to predict it from, from theoretical uh, models. So as exactly as, as Umar uh, introduced in his talk, we know that this is a hard problem since Paul Dirac in 1929 kind of finished, uh, established the first book on quantum mechanics and said, yeah, the underlying physical laws necessary for the mathematical theory of a large part of physics and the whole of chemistry are thus completely known. And it goes on, like Umar explained, so that uh, it becomes desirable that approximate practical methods of applying quantum mechanics should be developed so that we can predict, among other things, the properties of chemist, uh, chemical compounds and materials. Now, at the current state, the state-of-the-art method to predict the hardest cases of, of strongly correlated materials is what is called quantum Monte Carlo. I absolutely won't go into the details of quantum Monte Carlo. I want only to say that one of the key tricks that is used in this very sophisticated method is that we turn the problem to imaginary time. Imaginary time is a scary concept if you think about the philosophical implication of it, but in practice, it's only a mathematical trick. We just notice that uh, when you consider problems uh, in the frequency space, you have to do a Fourier transform which involves, which involves uh, those exponential factors uh, with complex the imaginary number i, the frequency and time. And when uh, you're, if you're familiar with statistical models in physics or even in machine learning energy-based model, you know that the temperature, which is beta in, in my case, the inverse temperature beta multiplies the energy in, in the same kind of exponentials. And in quantum physics, the energy is related to frequency by the famous uh, Planck constant. So you can go from one to the other, you could say, these are the same these have the same structure if you simply interpret beta hash bar as an imaginary time. And this is exactly what imaginary time is used for. It, it's used to treat temperature and the temperature dependence of, of the materials. And the problem with this, and this is where my, my title comes again, the problem is this, is that returning from an imaginary time to real time where the experiments are done is a very hard problem. It's an, what we known as an inverse problem. And the, the solution to this, the returning from imaginary time is known as analytic continuation. And when I say response functions, it's simply that to get the conductivity as a function of frequency, like was the, the aim of the project, you have to to do the analytic continuation of a response function called pi, big pi. Now this response function is expressed as a function of Matsubara frequencies, another scary concept, which is simply the Matsubara, uh, uh, the frequency in imaginary time, Matsubara frequencies. And the problem with this is that you get from Monte Carlo, you get those quantities, you get response function like this one, and it's very smooth and it, it's very easy or not very, very easy, but it, it's easier to compute than if you wanted to compute the real conductivity. And then what you would like to do is go from there and find the corresponding conductivity. And the relation between those two is an integral equation. And the integral has this response function on the left side. So it's not, what we want to do is not the, to integrate the problem and get the sensor. Actually, what we have is this side of the equation. We have the input x. And we would like to inverse the integral, which is something which is super hard to do, to get the conductivity. So I will go very quickly uh, through the details of the project. But basically, we use a neural network to do that, very simple, fully connected neural networks, in which we input this response function on, on, on the input of the neural network, and we get an estimate for the conductivity on, on the output. And since it's easy to do the problem in that direction, I can generate as many uh, synthetic conductivities as I want, simply compute the integral and know what would be the corresponding input for the neural network. So I can basically train the neural network with an infinite number of examples, which is an ideal scenario for neural networks. 
And when you do something like this with, for example, a 100,000 examples, you get very good results. So if you get this input to the neural network, you see that it reconstructs the targets very well. But in some cases, the problem is still very hard and the neural network best estimate doesn't fit all the time. And now the main problem with these approach, these were published several times in the literature. The main problem is that usually when you do that, you only consider the integral for one value of temperature. So those Matsubara frequencies I, I had in the previous slide at these positions are related to the temperature like this. Those are discrete frequencies with n being an integer, which are spaced according to the temperature. And if you want to consider many temperatures, uh, you find that the problem is actually ill-defined. That means that the same components pi can be obtained both for a spectrum sigma at temperature beta or for a spectrum which is rescaled like this with this constant s at a rescale temperature s. And this is illustrated here. So if you look at the blue spectrum, you see that the blue spectrum would give you the following function as a function of Matsubara frequencies for, for the, the pi. So when I say spectrum, I, I mean the conductivity. So if you look at the blue conductivity, you get those, uh, those, this response function as a function of the Matsubara frequencies. And depending on the temperature that you use, either beta or s beta or beta s, the samples that you get along this function are more or less spaced. And the problem with this is that if you do the same exercise for, for another function, let's say you take the yellow one with s sigma s, then you get another function as a function of Matsubara frequencies. But when you look at the samples for s beta, it falls exactly on the blue samples as a function of simply the number. So if I simply put the vector corresponding to those pi sampling in the, the problem, you will have uh, contradictory examples for the training of your neural network. Some of those uh, inputs will want to map on the yellow spectrum and the exact same input will want to map on the blue spectrum. So we came up, so our contribution for this problem was we came up with a rescaling procedure. We, we explain how to prepare the spectrum to avoid that degeneracy. And uh, there are some details according with, uh, that go with this, which I won't touch. And then when we compare the results for the res without the, this rescaling, whoops, without this rescaling and with this rescaling, we find that basically uh, if you train on some temperature and you try to validate on other temperatures, you get always better results with the rescaling than without the rescaling. So it's a very important step towards uh, getting these, uh, these analytic continuations. So to conclude, let me summarize. Quantum materials are an important part of the futures for technologies. Uh, the state-of-the-art simulations for quantum materials use sophisticated quantum Monte Carlo technique in imaginary time. And the problem is that returning from imaginary time is a very ill-conditioned problem, very hard problem. Now, this can be done with neural networks, but rescaling the targets properly will allow to generalize better and improve uh, the performance of your neural networks, uh, whatever the, the architectures you take. So that's it for my presentation. Thank you for your attention, and I will now take questions.